Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning on this, uh, wow, first Sunday of April, if you can imagine. Where has the year gone? Where has the time flown? Good to see you all here this morning. Uh, we just want to start with a couple of announcements before we kind of get dug in. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, if you have your bulletins, please look through them. There's lots of things there. But a couple things we do um, want to highlight. One is we will be hosting the Good Friday service uh, this year. And so that will be, interestingly enough, the Friday before Easter, Good Friday, right here at 10 o'clock in the morning is the plan. So I uh, encourage you to come out to that in just a, a wonderful time for us to celebrate the love of our Savior. And the other thing I... Uh, just one little announcement I'd like to make as well is that we're, as we're getting started back up again, as things finally start to become normal, uh, we've been talking to people and it's like, yes, we want to reintroduce the receiving, the collecting of an offering. To do that, however, we also need people who will collect the offering. And uh, so if you're interested in uh, helping with ushering in some way, uh, working on that, leading that kind of a, a ministry, uh, or just, you know, helping out, please, um, yeah, talk to me, let me know. We hope to get that started in the next couple of weeks. For a call to worship this morning, um, I chose a couple verses from Psalm 95. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's just open with a word of prayer and then I'm gonna call Cliff forward to lead us. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day we have. Thank you that we can gather together in this place. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to, to have our attention drawn uh, to you, away from all of those stresses of the week, away from all of the frustrations, uh, and, 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 and placed on the God who is in control. To be reminded that you are our God, you are a good God, you are a God who, who loves us, who cares for us so tenderly, so gently, so wonderfully. So God, go before us this morning. Help us to worship. Thank you that we can be here. Uh, direct our thoughts, we pray. Speak to our hearts in every which way imaginable. And I just pray out this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cliff, please. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. I'm, I'm it this morning. We're going to do some hymns this morning. We're going to do some Easter hymns because Easter is coming up in a week and a half, two weeks. I was saying that we can sing Christmas hymns four or five weeks before Christmas. We're going to sing Easter hymns two weeks before Easter. So that's what we're going to do today is we're going to sing some Easter hymns. Harry, who's normally with me, he's in Mexico today. He's flying to Mexico. I don't know why he chose that over this. I'm not sure, but for some reason he did. But uh, yeah, we want to sing some hymns today. So glad that you're here with us. I hope you had a better week than I did this week. It was, a, it was an interesting week. Like I said to Joanne this morning, I said, you know, it's been a tough week when uh, the girls at the admitting desk at emergency know you by name and go, you're here again. What's going on? You know, and, so it's been an interesting week, but God is good. And God walks through all of our problems with us, and he's there for us. And that's, that's the positive thing, is that when we trust in God and we rely, rely on God, we're going to be fine. And I know that. So we want to sing several Easter hymns this morning. And I invite you to either follow in your hymn book or on the screen behind me. The first one we want to sing is hymn number 292, Because He Lives. A lot of these songs have got amazing words, incredible words. And when you sing these songs, just think about the words as we sing them together. Let's stand together as we sing all three verses. Because he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. 
because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my song gets to me it just the, the chorus is amazing next one we want to sing is oh I'm not sure what number this is Christ arose thank you I cut it off on my copy so I didn't see it 298 Christ arose <laughs> i 
next one we want to sing is actually one of my favorite hymns. It's not one we sing very often. I, I realize now that some of these are kind of, they're, they're kind of a morbid theme because they talk a lot about eternity, talk about what our life is going to be like, but, but it gives us that hope. We know that whatever happens to us, we are going to be in Christ. This one is hymn number 313, The King is Coming. First time I heard this hymn was over 40 years ago. And it was sung at a funeral, and I was just so impressed with it. And I just, again, it's, it's just the words on it. The king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sound, and now his face I see. The king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God. He's coming for me. We have that hope that no matter what happens to us, God is there for us. And he's going to come for us at some point in our lives. Hymn number 313, The King is Coming. is empty no more traffic in the streets all the builders tools are silent no more time to harvest wheat busy housewives cease their labor in the courtroom all debate work on earth is all suspended the king comes through the gate. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the king
sing one more hymn before we turn it back to Daniel. And again, it's one of my favorites. This seems to be a theme going here. You know, I, when, you, when you get to this Easter time, there's a lot of these good old hymns that, that we haven't sung for a long time, and they're, they're amazing hymns. The Old Rugged Cross, hymn number 256, speaks of, of the cross, and I'll cherish that old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last. 
Thank you. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 27. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as Jews, uh, as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, uh, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without the law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are uh, without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. <clears throat> I have become all things to all men, so that by all means uh, save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that all those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. This is the word of the Lord. Time to dismiss the children to Children's Church to Sunday School. You want to come on up here and I will just pray with y'all. Jim. Nice. How are you doing today? Good. Good to know. Well, let me just pray with you, and then you guys can go, and I believe Roseanne is going to be looking after some of y'all, and so let's just pray. Oh, oh. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord God, thank you. Thank you for these kids. Thank you for just the treasure that they are, for the hope that they represent in so many ways. Thank you for the great responsibility they are as well for us. Lord, help us to do all we can to raise them to know you bless them lord help them to have a good time help them to learn things help them to uh, just more and more be discipled may they know you each and every day of their lives we pray and we ask this in jesus name amen amen a little tiny herd of buffalo leaving this morning. It's good to hear. We're going to take, uh, take a moment to uh, bow our hearts uh, before the Lord again, and let's just, let's just go before him with, with some of our requests again this week. Let's just pray together. Lord, mm, I want to begin by, by thanking you for who you are. You are the almighty God you are <laughs> all wise, all knowing. You are holy. You are perfect. And God, as we've sung this morning, been reminded this morning, we are none of those things, and we are in desperate need of salvation, and you provided that. And Lord, we are very, very grateful. Lord, thank you that, that you would leave behind 
so many of the splendors of, of heaven has come down to earth for us. To offer yourself up as that perfect sacrifice on our behalf. Um, Lord, help us uh, to be very mindful of this, to live accordingly. Um, help us to really consider that over the course of the next few weeks, too, as we approach this season. Lord, that you would just uh, continue to mold us into your image. So thank you for that, Lord. God, we also know that this week has been a week of many ups and downs for many people, and we've uh, heard stories of answers to tremendous prayers and um, seen hope restored. And at the same time, we know other people have gone through very miserable weeks full of anguish and despair. God, we thank you that uh, you are still there in each and every one of those situations. It doesn't make, uh, it doesn't change who you are. You are still allowing things for your purposes. You are still very much at work. Lord, thank you for lifting up those who have been down. And God, we just continue to ask that you would do that for those who are still down. Lord, strengthen our people. Lord, we want to lift up some who have been uh, very much struggling with health issues again. Lord, we want to lift up Elmer, who is having uh, surgery on Tuesday. We want to lift up George, who is in the hospital in Jasper and, and potentially facing surgery as well. Lord, uh, and uh, among so many others, Lord, we, we, we love these two dear gentlemen, and uh, we are grateful for the, the long lives that you've given them and their faithfulness. And Lord, we just pray that your mercy would be with them, that you would continue to sustain them. We do pray for healing. Lord, we, we leave that into your hands. Just encourage, encourage those men, God, we would pray. God, we also want to pray for our, our church, for our, our body at this time, and we thank you for uh, just your, your presence, your activity here. Uh, continue to form us, Lord, we ask. Lord, we know... Um, we have a number of ministries that have needs at this point in time where as we are trying to transition back. Lord, I pray that you would raise up people to meet these challenges. Lord, give us people who would um, just share of their, their time and their, their giftedness um, to encourage, to build up, to make it possible for others to learn and grow as well. Uh, Lord, you know the needs, you know the hearts, you know your plans. Lord, we just trust this to you. Go before us in this regard as well, we pray. God, I want to lift up our, our missionaries of the week as well. We think of the Mir homes and the, the work they do in Uganda, and we are grateful for them. Lord, we praise you for the work that is being done there and that these denominations and or Christian organizations are coming together to, to know how to best utilize missionaries that come in and how to send out their own and to among their own people. Lord, I pray that, that you will give them a productive set of meetings, that it would be your plan that you would guide. We also pray for the Muir homes as they have transitions coming up, coming back for a home assignment, uh, don't know what their future is going to look like. Lord God, we just uh, pray that you would give them rest in you and that you would reveal clearly your plan for them. God, I just, we do. We're grateful for all the gifts you give us. We are grateful for uh, the offerings that we are able to receive, whether in a little envelope in the back or via the computer, whatever means. Lord, thank you for providing. We are very, very grateful. We continue to ask that you would uh, grant us the wisdom to know how to spend this money. We want to glorify you in that. Guide us, we pray. God, go before us now as we look into your word. Speak, we ask. Speak loudly. Speak clearly. Uh, Holy Spirit, just touch our hearts that we could become more and more like you. And I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. An experiment was conducted in the, the 1960s by a psychologist named Walter uh, Michelle at a preschool that was on the campus of Stanford University. And, and children were told that they could have one treat, such as a marshmallow, right now, or if they waited while their 
teacher went out and, and did a little task uh, that they would be able to have two marshmallows. This was a major dilemma for these children, as you can imagine, preschoolers. And remember, this is the 60s when treats weren't so readily uh, available. And so, of course, some of the, the preschoolers, they took the marshmallow because they just couldn't resist that temptation. But others decided they were going to try and stick it out, and they did for what must have seemed to have been like an endless 20 minutes until the teacher returned. And, and it was funny, you can just imagine, you know, the things they did, and, and you can just picture them, and, and they say that some of the kids just, you know, covered their eyes so they wouldn't have to look at, at the marshmallow. And, and some of them, you know, put their head on their hands. Others talked to themselves. Some sang. A few even tried to nap, uh, if you can imagine, because the temptation was so great. But in the end, these plucky kids got two marshmallows. It was difficult, but they were able to control their desire to get an even greater reward. This morning we are concluding our journey through this list of the, the fruit of the Spirit in uh, Galatians chapter 5, this, this list of attributes of God, of, of his virtues that we as, as new uh, creations in, in Christ are called to develop. And, and we're ending, obviously, with the last one, self-control. Self-control can be a very difficult fruit for many of us. It's one we don't particularly uh, like. We, we struggle limiting our own needs and our own passions and desires and, and wants. It's hard. Shortly after we arrived in Belgium, I was leading a Bible study. We were going through James, and I got to a part on, on the tongue. I was doing this through an interpreter. Uh, we, this is still early days. Karen's smiling because she knows what's coming. And... Um, Everything was going fine until Olga just went completely ballistic on me. And, and what was worse is that nobody wanted to translate what she was saying to me in this Bible study. So let me tell you, it was a wee bit on the awkward side. But afterwards, I was talking to somebody and I got the gist of what she was all mad about. Uh, she didn't feel the need to have to change who she was. And essentially, she said, if God had made her an obnoxious loudmouth, well, that is just the way he must want her. And so she doesn't have to control that behavior. Can you imagine? Self-control is difficult. It's not something that we really want. Uh, so what just, just what is it exactly that we're looking at uh, this morning? Uh, well, the word that is translated as self-control uh, in that we find in Galatians there, uh, speaks about a person who has learned to master his passions and his desires. And this world, a word, enkratia, uh, yeah, oh man, I just butchered that, but thankfully none of you speak Greek either, so we're all fine. Um, it, it really, it, it's made up of two words. One is eng, uh, which means you know, to stay in place, a fixed position, to be rigid somewhere, and Kratos, which speaks of force or, or strength. And so it carries with it the idea of the strength to stay in place or the ability to stand firm in the faith. William Barclay, a theologian, uh, defined it as that great quality that comes to a man when Christ is in his heart, that quality that makes him able to live and to walk in the world and yet to keep his garments unspotted from the world. And so this fruit of self-control uh, really speaks about the spirit-enabled ability to deny ourselves, to limit ourselves, to limit our desires, even in difficult situations that may take substantial effort for the glory of God to live as he would want us to live. And, and this fruit actually applies to every little aspect of our lives. Some people think it only applies to those bigger sin type areas, those things like excessive alcohol consumption or, or sins of a, a sexual nature. Um, that is totally not 
the case, no matter what people might want to believe. Uh, think about it. We wouldn't have eight fruit listed calling us to, to be radically changed more and more into the image of God, only to have the list ended with like a, a mild reminder not to do the really bad things. Uh, and so, no, this does apply to every aspect, every facet of our life, all of our actions and, and, and attitudes uh, in regard to other people. So turn back, if you uh, would, to our scripture reading, 1 Corinthians 9. Thank you, Logan, for reading that. And, and we find uh, in, in this passage that Logan read, um, Paul is teaching about how that we are uh, to go out living life, how we are to run this race of life uh, in such a way, disciplined, self-controlled, so that we uh, can win a prize. It's a very um, understandable illustration that he uses there uh, from the world of sports. And, and as we look at the broader context, though, we'll, we'll get a greater understanding of, of where he's going with this whole topic, this whole self-control thing. So let's start back in chapter 8, and I'll ask you to kind of follow along because we're going to go zipping through it. So here's the problem starting in chapter 8. Eight. The people are struggling with this whole area of, of food, of meat in particular, that has been sacrificed to idols. Uh, a large part of the meat that you would find at the market or on your you know, neighbor's table had come from animals that had been sacrificed to these you know, foreign gods, to these idols at, at those many temples and cults that, that Corinth was famous for. And so many believers obviously held that, you know, these gods are not real. They hold absolutely no power uh, over our God. And, and so there's nothing wrong at all with eating this meat. We are not participating in this cult. We are not worshiping false gods. It's just meat that we, by the grace of God, are able to eat. But other believers, probably those who had come directly out of, of some of those cults couldn't get past the fact that, that the meat had been used in this way. They had trouble separating the meat from the belief system. And, and so they sincerely believed that, you know, eating this meat was to participate in or to condone this idolatry. Now, were they right in that thought? No. Paul refers to them himself as being the weaker uh, brothers, weaker in the faith. Um, but in the event, this was a situation that was in the church and it was causing division and, and judgment and, and uh, both sides were looking down on one, another, on one another. So Paul's approach then was to use an illustration from his own life regarding the mature use of liberty that we have in Christ. And now we start picking it up in chapter 9, so you can move ahead to there. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, there were people who said, you know what, Paul, you do not have the right to get support from the church in Corinth. You also don't have the right uh, to stay working. You know, you have been called as a minister of the gospel, and so that's what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to come here and work. You don't even have the right to bring a wife with you. Uh, because of your calling, you have to come here and work, uh, not doing anything else, ministering only to us, no other distractions. Were they right in this? Again, no. And so what Paul does is he demonstrates over the next few verses, um, he makes multiple arguments from the Bible to support that, you know, there is absolutely nothing wrong with him receiving uh, support. And then we get to verse 12 and following, and we start to get his point. He says, you know what? Yes, I do have the right to do this. In no way would it be a sin for me to receive financial support. However, because there are some who can and will and do take offense to the point of it harming their relationship with God, I'm going to voluntarily give up this right. We see that in, in verse 12, where he says, Nevertheless, we did not use this right 
but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. And, and he goes on to say that he's not even asking for support, even by saying this, so that they would see that he was unselfishly serving the Lord on their behalf, that he wouldn't cause them to stumble. And Paul words this um, wonderfully, beautifully, a number of times in, in these three chapters. Back in verse 8, he says, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. In chapter 10, 23, and 24, he says, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. And so that is a lot of self-control that we see there. It's a deliberate, this is one part of it, a deliberate personal limitation for the sake of the gospel. You know, we may have the right to do something, but that doesn't mean that we should do that thing. Uh, in fact, many times it's wrong for us to continue on uh, to do those things in front of other people in front of the weaker brothers. And we see this in, in chapter 8. Again, going back, starting in verse 10, it says, For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? In other words, you know, if he sees you and, and you give him the ability to do what he knows is wrong, um, you know, and, and cause him then to feel guilt or cause him then to think it's okay to compromise in, in sin? No, that's not good. It, it, he continues on here saying, for, th for through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sitting against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against God. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble... I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. That's self-control. It's doing what's good for others to the glory of God. And you know, that's how Paul lived. And we see in, in, in uh, chapter 9, verses 19 to 23 then, that even though he was free, he made himself as a slave to other people. Why? To reach them. To the Jews, he became like a Jew. Uh, to those uh, under the law, he, he became as one under the law. To the weak, to the spiritually you know, immature, who perhaps put a little bit too much emphasis on non-salvation issues, he became weak. And, and Paul, by saying this, isn't revealing that he's a hypocrite, you know, preaching one thing, living something different. It, it does not imply at all that he was watering down the gospel because the people absolutely knew uh, who he was and, and what he stood for, but quite simply, he knew that where these people struggled. And so he was careful not to lead them astray. He controlled, he sacrificed his right for their benefit. Now, of course, this, this you know, raises the question of what on earth does it mean to offend somebody? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's not, as some people I've had to deal with uh, at times, misinterpret it to mean that it's doing anything that somebody else doesn't like. Oh, that offends me. Um, no, that's not it at all. You know, there's a lot of people in a church, and if we all had to stop doing stuff just because it was the way somebody didn't like it, we would never accomplish anything. We'd, we'd just shut the doors because there's no point. Um, and so this passage is not saying that. Although even in you know, those kind of situations, we need to demonstrate self-control. We do need to be careful of what others, how they feel. But a great way of answering this question is to look at the, reason that, the reasons that Paul lays out in this chapter regarding why, are we, why we are to develop this fruit, why we are to practice this fruit. We can see here that we practice self-control um, so that weaker brothers don't stumble or remain weak in the faith. We do it so that people will come to the Lord, so that God will be glorified. 
and so that we ourselves will receive blessings and the rewards of faithfulness. And, and so that helps us a lot. Will this cause someone to not come to know the Lord? Will what I'm doing cause somebody to, to stumble, to, to, not, to lose their face, to not grow up, to not see the power and the glory and the grace of our God. And, and this can be very far reaching. If our need to things, to have things our way uh, truly will hurt others in their faith, we need to stop those things. That is the self-control that Paul is talking about here. But that's only one aspect of self-control. Uh, self-control goes beyond matters of personal liberty. Uh, in our definition, which again, I, I got out of lexicons and, and uh, some st good study volumes, uh, the definition says it speaks of the ability to stand firm in the faith. It talks about obedience to our God. It's the mastering of sinful desires and, and practices and passions. And so as we continue on to chapter 10, then Paul continues to develop this theme um, by reminding the believers here uh, of the sinfulness of the people that Moses led out of Egypt. And in, in verse 6 we read, Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. So he's still talking uh, about self-control here. Because the Israelites didn't control themselves in, in a wide variety of areas. They didn't control their grumbling. They didn't control their discontentment. Um, they didn't control, you know, immorality. They put their own personal uh, desires above the Lord's will. And, and because of that, they faced a wide variety of consequences as well. There was a, a, a plague of serpents that caused great fear. There was... Uh, uh, coming under the displeasure of God, and they also faced death, both physically and eternally speaking. And, and then in, in verse 6, oh wait, verse 11, it repeats essentially verse 6. It says, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages has come. And so he bookended that. Watch out, he says. Make sure that you can control your passions. Don't disregard the Lord and, and his truth and thus bring physical and emotional and spiritual consequences into your world. Practice self-control. Now, now Corinth being Corinth, being the, just an absolute mess of a city, full of idolatry and um, very open and, and very uh, promoted immorality, they had great temptations around them. And Hinton being Hinton, uh, we have all of those temptations around us as well. And we also have other temptations, big and small, daily things, things that, well, come on, they're not that bad. And yet they still cause grievous harm to us. They are, are horrible sins that we need to flee from. And so let me just go through a few of these things. And again, uh, self-control deals with living faithfully to God. We need to learn to have self-control, for example, in regard to our anger. Man, that's one a lot of us uh, struggle with, don't we? It's so easy to get angry at so many things in life, right? Oh, my goodness, let's see, uh, the waitress. I wanted a salad, she brought fries, and it's going to, you know, disrupt my whole world for nine seconds. We get angry about that. The way that guy drives in traffic, what a nub. Oh, my goodness, can you believe that? Um, the government. Ooh. Right? Get yeah, a little ticked at the government. I dropped my screwdriver when I was working. Oh, doesn't that just make you go crazy. Um, here's one. Life in general. Yeah, that kind of makes us angry at times. Right? Just, just all the nonsense going along. And it's so easy to lose it 
on these things. But God has a word for pe- people who get angry quickly. Now, that word is fools. And he says in Proverbs 14, 17, a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. Anger affects so many things. This is why God hates it in an improper form. It it affects us physically, mentally, uh, spiritually. It causes stress, faster heart rates, higher blood pressure, anxiety, fear, bitterness. Yeah, that comes. That'll just eat you up from the inside out. It destroys relationships and and testimonies. It it, it does so much harm. However, as we learn to control this emotion, and I'm not talking just about the outward uh, manifestations of it, but also as we learn to control the, the inward, internal emotions and motivations, great things happen. Stress decreases as our reliance on God and and our desire to live his way increases. Relationships improve when there is no fear of anger. There is a a new openness and an opportunity for growth and and development and and love and and evangelism for healing and restoration. People and churches grow as the arrogance and self-righteousness and impatience that lead to anger are replaced by the desire to offer grace instead. God is well pleased, and then we see his benefits and not the consequences. Samuel Stokes was a missionary who walked through the Punjab years ago, um, just sharing the gospel from village to village. And he arrived uh, in this one village and received a very nasty welcome. They did not treat him with any kind of respect or hospitality. They just degraded him in every way they possibly could. And he just courteously accepted that. That lasted for two long days. In the beginning of the third day, the the headsman of the the village came and he uh, laid his turban down at Mr. Stokes' feet as a sign of respect. And he explained that he had heard that Jesus' disciples were commanded to love. He'd heard, you know, what was happening in other villages. People were getting the message through. And he decided he was going to put them to the test. And, And the result was amazing. Because now, after they had seen that, you know, this guy controls his anger. This guy demonstrates love. They brought him the best food, and they were very eager to hear what he had to say. If he had lost his temper, he would have blown that. Self-control of our anger accomplishes great things. The tongue is uh, another area where we have a tendency to to struggle. Just ask Olga. We are not in contact with Olga anymore, just in case anybody's wondering. Uh, I don't even remember Olga's last name, so it's all good. Um, You know, it's one of the smallest parts of the body, and yet it's one that can do the most harm. And if you read through James 3, oh my goodness, the way it describes the tongue, it, it calls it a fire, the very world of iniquity, untamable, full of deadly poison. Um, It's not wrong. How often can we just blurt out a few words, sometimes sarcastically, sometimes, you know, heat of the moment, anger. Uh, We just can be caustic. We can maybe be uh, inconsiderate. And, And it's easy to go, well, you know, it's not that bad. It didn't really hurt us, so what's the big deal? I read of a a woman who uh, had a bit of a problem with a a sharp, quick tongue, and uh, she was confronted by uh, one of the the elders in the church, and she said, hey, it's no big deal. I just shoot my words off fast, and it's over. And the man responded, you can say the same thing about guns and bullets. We fire them off fast, um, but look at the damage. It's so true. To us, they may be nothing. It's just a way of voicing our displeasure or whatever, but we don't know how it's going to affect that other person. And our words can do an amazing amount of 
of damage that we can't see. It leads to stress, it leads to fear, broken relationships, someone not growing and developing like they could because, well, why would we listen to you? Even somebody not coming to the Lord. However, as we learn to use our tongues appropriately, use them for good things, good things happen. Proverbs 16, 24 tells us, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. How many times have just a few little words of encouragement buoyed you throughout an entire day? Lots of times. I know encouraged, I have a tendency to work better. We all understand the benefits of encouragement. We talked about it last week a little bit. Um, that's what happens with a controlled tongue. Finances are another area, perhaps, where we need to deal with some self-control. I saw just this week um, that as of the end of 2021, the average Albertan adult had $25,172 in debt, and that's not mortgages, that's not businesses, most of that's bad debt. Shane is nodding his head in agreement. 25 grand per adult. Karen and I are below average. Thank you, Jesus. Um, can you imagine every, the average couple in Alberta, $50,000 worth of, of bad debt. You know, overspending can be actually be a spiritual problem. It, it stems from a, a lack of discipline or maybe uh, a lack of contentment can come from selfishness and uh, greed or, or even a lack of trust in the Lord. And again, it causes problems. I'm just trying to highlight all the issues. Uh, lots of stress, all manner of stress. It can lead to marital problems. It, it leads to divorce. I've seen that more than once. Sometimes it even leads, and I've seen this as well, it leaves us unable to follow God in the way that he is calling us maybe to us some sort of ministry or service or to be able to give how he asks us to give. And, and developing self-control in this area frees us from all of these burdens. It enables us to serve God how he desires. Uh, and, you know, there's so many other areas we could have talked about where we need to exhibit self-control, but hopefully we've gotten the point. Giving in to our, our sinful desires, while they may give us a, a momentary satisfaction, they ultimately always lead to a, diff, a, a, a dissatisfaction. And those things that seem just irresistible leave us empty and leave us useless. So, now that I've said all that, how on earth do we develop self-control? I know many of us have been working on self-control in certain areas for decades, and yet, here we are. We, we still struggle. What is the secret to self-control? A couple things here that we need to remember. And the first of them is, as always, this is a fruit of the Spirit. This is not something that we, as fallen human beings, can do on our own, despite our best efforts. Do not be misled, do not be confused by the word self in the name of this fruit. We, on our own, cannot grow it. We may work hard to reel in certain outward things that we do. We might work hard to change certain attitudes about, about things, but without the Holy Spirit working uh, in our hearts to change our motivations, to give us a desire for the Father more than anything else, all we are going to accomplish is a little bit of moralism that is gonna be shaky at best and will come crashing down when under pressure. That's the reality. We cannot do this on our own. We need his assistance in this. I think we need to be asking not just what those areas are, but also why we, we struggle with 
these indulgences. You know, obviously it has to do with us having our eyes focused on ourselves rather than, than on him. Um, but is that due to immaturity? Is that due to um, ignorance of God and his ways? Is that due to sometimes just rebellion, sinful rebellion? Could be that there's other areas in our lives in our in our walk with the lord that we struggle with and so they uh you know add to this these are areas that we don't turn over to the lord um you know if we doubt god's provision we might not be able to control that greed or that selfishness that demands that we hold on to everything if we doubt god's sovereignty we might not be able to control our need to be in control of all things. We are demanding. We are rough with other people. If we don't find our joy in the Lord, we might seek out our pleasures in other ways that are, are wrong. Not just inappropriate, but, but sinful. Whatever it is, the first step, I believe, to self-control is asking God for his help to reveal these areas and some of our motivations for them, the hidden causes. And then what we have to do is ask him for strength in these areas. He's always there to help. Take a look at, at uh, chapter 10, verse 13. It says, you know what? No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. He will always give us strength. He will always give us a way of escape. We might not like that way of escape. <laughs> we might not want it. But you know, it's there. He gives us the ability to avert our eyes to change conversations, to walk out of the room. He gives us the strength not to retaliate, to not say those words that we want to uh, sometimes say. He gives us the comfort to accept rejection. He gives us the reminder of his love and his grace and his holiness so that we would seek that. So we really do need to learn to look to him and to rely on him in every situation. And the other thing we need to remember is that we really do need to commit ourselves to this task. In his strength, for his glory, yes, but we need to do our part. We need to commit. And then ultimately we will receive a reward. This is not always easy. You know, there's a lot of work. Oh my goodness, it's a lot of work. Uh, it can be painful. It requires sacrifice. Uh, and Paul did not, for a moment, try to tell the people otherwise. And that's, in fact, I believe, why he used that illustration from sports. It was a, a, an illustration that the people of Corinth would have understood. Athletics. Uh, the Ithsmian Games in Corinth had recently made a comeback. It had been a, a huge deal uh, before Christ and, and due to Roman rule, it kind of fell out of favor for a while. But in recent years, it had become a big thing in Corinth again. It was a major sporting event, uh, largely horseback events, um, boxing, wrestling, and the ancient form of mixed martial arts, if you can believe it. Um, but it was a huge thing and it was just below the level of the Olympics. And I think, you know, we've maybe recently seen the Olympics and so we can get a little bit uh, of what Paul is, is saying here. Why do athletes compete? It's to hopefully gain a medal. They train for hours on end. Oh, they stretch and they lift weights and, you know, they repeat and repeat and repeat you know, whatever is necessary for their event. They push through no matter 
what the weather is. They just keep going at it whether they, they want to or not. They follow strict diets and curfews. No midnight trips to get a Frosties at Wendy's, unfortunately, for most of these people. There's so much discipline and sacrifice involved. And why do they do it? Why do they give up all of these things that we would consider good? You know, food, fun, free time. They do it in order to win a prize. And that's why we do it as well. However, as Paul says, they do it to receive a perishable wreath made out of celery, in case anybody's interested, um, but we, an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. We are doing this for a much greater prize. We are doing this for God's glory. It's for others to be able to find salvation. It's for the promise of eternal rewards. So the, the challenge for us this morning, as, as usual, is just, it's very simple in words, but uh, an awful lot harder to actually do. As believers in Christ, we need to examine our lives. Are we self-controlled? Are we willing to limit our needs and our desires and our passions for the sake of the gospel? Do we desire to place our eyes completely on Christ to live that crucified life that he keeps calling us to for his honor and his glory with the promise of a great reward? Or are we content to exchange eternal rewards for temporary ones that are just way less satisfying? You know, the benefits of self-control, of, of, of sacrificing a few rights and needs and wants far outweighs the cost. Intimacy with, uh, service to, and the joy of the Lord bring us so much more than all the indul indulgence in the world can ever hope to. And so I just want to encourage us all to, to take stock of our lives right now to end with verse 31. So that whether then we eat or drink or whatever we do, it is done all for the glory of God. Greatness, usefulness, glory in the Lord come from a spirit-enabled self-control. Let's close with a word of prayer there, shall we? God, I, I, I thank you um, just again for how you reveal yourself to us in so many ways. And Lord, through the fruit of the Spirit, we see who you are. And we see your desire um, for us. Lord, these aren't, uh, it, it's so easy just to gloss over this entire list and go, eh, three out of nine, that's not so bad. And, um, and not to take them seriously. And yet, God, this is what you are calling us to do. This is who you are calling us to be. Lord, help us in these things. Help us to take this serious, not out of legalism, but just out of a desire to know you and to serve you. You are this great and awesome God who loves us so much that you came to earth to die on the cross to pay our penalty. Lord, help us. Help us to be mindful, even as we think of these things today, of, of self-control. Lord, may we guard our tongues. May we trust you in each and every facet of our lives. May you be the one in control. So God, go before us with this. Um, yeah, do a great thing in us, we would ask. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Clifford. Clifford. <clears throat>
<clears throat> when I first came up here this morning, I said, you were only stuck with me. Well, that isn't true because I couldn't do this without Barb and Lillian, without their help and support. So I want to just thank them for helping me and supporting me in, in leading hymns. We want to close with hymn number 299. He lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. Would you stand with me as we sing all three verses? joining us. Thank you for worshiping together with us. I pray that God in some ways uh, has spoken to each and every one of us this morning. As always, if there's anything we can do, let us know. We delight in doing that or, or making the effort. I'm just going to close 
a little benediction. I pray that the beauty of the grace of God comfort and strengthen each one of us in our journey this week. Amen. God bless. We are dismissed.